Am I sharing? Looks like I'm not sharing, but I don't see. Not sharing yet, sir. I don't see the share thingy. My window is differently oriented. Is somebody else the host currently? <laughs> I don't know. No, I you're, you're the host, Dr. Dungar. Yeah, I started. So my, my orientation of this thing went into tablet mode and became kind of, oh, there it is. Let's see. Hey, now looks like we are back in the business. Hey, welcome back everybody. I hope you had a nice break. And today I sent you email about the final exam. So hope uh, you guys uh, received the email and you know it. And my setup is today slightly different. Because of that, I cannot see live chat, okay? Uh, so, So I see there is a question on the chat. I am opening chat right now, but during the, uh, you know, lecture today, I'm not going to be checking the chat. So if we want to swap our final grade with one of the midterms, oh, looks like, uh, I don't know if I made that clear. You are not swapping your final with the midterm. It's all the way around. If you think you did not do very well in the midterm, and if you think you can do better in the final, then you can choose to swap one of your midterm with your finals grade. So you have to take final, okay? So oh, just to clarify, Dr. D, you're saying you have to take the final. So like with me, I'm looking at my two midterms and they were minimal. And so like, I probably won't do better on my final, even though I'd like to. Mm -hmm. So you just go for it. Is that what you do? You just don't, we don't have to tell you anything. Nope, you don't. Only if you believe you can do your final. So remember, you have to take your final. Okay, there is no way around. I think 20% comes from the final. And so you have to take final. But if you believe you had a bad day in one of your midterm and didn't do well, but you believe you can do better in final than one of those tests, then you can ask me, can I have my either midterm one or two be replaced by my final grade, but you cannot tell that after you see your final score. You have to decide now. Otherwise, of course, everybody wants to swap if they get better, right? I'm giving you opportunity to challenge yourself and do better in final, okay? Uh, so if you, do, if you want to take that challenge, you have to let me know before final. So within this week, you have to send me an email and read email for the detail, okay? So remember, you're not swapping final for the midterm, with the midterm, no. Final cannot be replaced by midterm, but one of the midterm can be replaced by final. Okay. <laughs> 
and the economy. Yes. Is that for better or for worse? Like there's no like only better. It's if you do bad, then you get bad grade for both of them. Oh, if it was uh, that, then I don't need to ask you, right? Every will, everybody will take that deal, right? <laughs> so if, uh, you know, if that was the case, no, that's not. It's a better or worse. So if you decide now and uh, uh, let's say if you did worse in the final, then that final grade also going to be one of your midterm grade, okay, which you decide to swap with. So yes. It's not a risk free. So it's only for those who think they did really worse in the midterm, okay, and can do better in the final. Only for those I'm giving chance. Okay. So maybe I'll send another email. I noticed that we have FCQs up and it's already running and it's gonna be closing tomorrow. And I love to hear uh, your feedback, okay, through the FCQs. So I want you guys to, you know, complete that. I may decide to give you incentive. So I'll write about that in the email rather than talking here, okay? So remember, we have FCQs due by tomorrow night. So I, ask you guys to complete that. And uh, if let's say 90% of you guys complete that, I may give very good incentive. And what is that in incentive? I'll write that in the email, okay? So now let's get back to the oscillations. So last class we talked about oscillations and specifically talked about oscillation of mass hanging on the spring and also the oscillation of a pendulum, right? And uh, we did a couple of examples. We did some uh, clicker questions, but here uh, we did not quite do this problem. This one seems to be interesting as well. So let's take a look, although the method is same. So, so for example, by just using a pendulum and counting a couple of, you know, like few swings and finding the period, you can tell what's the gravitational field is strength in another place, another planet. Let's suppose you landed in a new planet and you wanna know how strong the gravitational pull is. So in that case, you can just use a simple pendulum and figure that out, okay? So this is what this question is about. So that's why it is uh, an interesting problem. I do not wanna skip, okay? So here it says a pendulum clock has a period of that many on the arc, right? So period on the art is given. So let's write down, huh, why it's not writing? Huh, it wouldn't let me write on the slide. My setup got messed up today for some reason. Looks like it doesn't like that.
Dr. Mugana, I don't know if you switched out of tablet mode, but a student is suggesting in the chat that if you go to the control center, you can switch out of the tablet mode. She, she's. Um, and how do I go to the control center? I don't have keyboard attached. <laughs> it was the, it's the, on your screen, it's the thing in the bottom right hand corner, the little, it's like a text message box with that moon in it. Yeah, that oh, one. Okay, I see. Huh. Yes, tablet mode. And then, yeah, you just click tablet mode. Yeah, you just click that button, it turns it off. Okay, so tablet mode is gone. So now, so in tablet mode, I cannot write on the thing even. That's kind of weird, isn't it? Okay, now my Zoom window all gone. Looks like now I can write, hopefully. Yes, I can. Okay, thank you for help. So, period of pendulum on the Earth and another planet. So, let's say on Earth. We have period is that much. So let's say period on the earth is 0 0.650 seconds. It is taken to another planet. So another planet. say x, so tx is 0 0.862 and question is, so gravitational field is strength, ge on the earth is g, we know that, right? So now question is gx is what? g on that planet is what? So this G means it's a 9.8, we know that, right? So now how do we do it? So it's a two planets and one pendulum. So period, we know is two pi L over G, where G is gravitational field strength and L is length of pendulum. So it's the same pendulum. Means L is same. Okay, so we're not changing the length. So somehow we need to get rid of length. So length is inside this square bracket. So maybe it's gonna be easier if we do t square as four pi square L over G. If we do that, and that way we can get rid of L. So let's write this for, so for earth, This equation can be written as four pi square L over G on the earth. So that's that. And for planet, for planet X, we can do the same thing. Tx square is four pi square L over G on planet X. So L is same for both of them. So that's why I'm not writing LX or L earth, L E. I'm not doing that. I don't need to do that because it's the same pendulum, right? So now once I have that, what do I wanna, what do I wanna find? I wanna find GX. I wanna get rid of L 
So I think better way to do that. So one way to do that is to solve for L, one of the equations, solve for L and substitute that to another one. So that's one way. Another way, just divide one equation by another equation. So let's do that. Another, okay. So that means let's divide off equation square by planet. So when we divide the equation, what happens is left hand side gets divided by left hand side, right hand side gets divided by right hand side. So when we do that, what's gonna happen? This four pi square, this four pi square gonna cancel, leaving us L over GE from the, this equation, off equation. And then from the planet X equation, we're gonna have L over GX, but it's gonna be all the way down here. So fraction of fraction, we can invert and convert that into multiplication. So that means it becomes GX over L and L cancels. So say we did, we did cancel four pi square and we did also cancel L. So that's the advantage of dividing one equation by another equation. So that's a simple mathematical trick. So now we want GX, right? So what we do, we bring this GE, which is in denominator, it's gonna go in numerator. So GX is gonna be TE square over TX square times G. So we know everything means we should be able to get the value of G. Do we expect value of G smaller or larger? Period got, became longer, right? Period has become longer here. T larger means G must be smaller or larger. So, I know you guys are writing on the chat, but for some reason I cannot. Uh, smaller. Smaller, right. So are you getting a smaller value of G here? Did anybody got that number? Yeah, I got a 5.58. 5.58? 5 .58. 5 .58. Okay. So yes, so we can say 5.6, safely, right? <laughs> Which is smaller than 9.8. So yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So unit here is meter over second is square. So it's gonna be same unit, okay? So that's how, see, now you, you know the field strength. If you measure the size of that planet, then you can tell what's the mass of the planet using that because G can also be written as GM over R square for that planet. If you know G, and if you know, let's say somehow radius. So if we are looking at planet at a distance, we can actually measure how big it is from a bit far before we reaching there, right? So if we can figure out what the radius is, we can calculate mass with that. So pendulum can be used to find mass of a planet if we know its radius. So that's, that's something, isn't it? You don't need big scale. Oh, how would you use a scale to find the mass of Earth or any other planet? Impossible. But see, well, this little trick, not trick, little knowledge from the math, physics and math I'm gonna help you to do that. And that's how we know mass of these, all these different planets and so on and so on. Okay, we use this kind of technique. So that is about the uh, period of the oscillation of uh, this pendulum or mass spring system or anything that's going on the simple harmonic motion, right? So now let's talk about energy of the system. So what's the energy? 
we are mostly focusing, we're gonna be focusing on uh, mechanical energy here. We are neglecting friction, okay? So that means it's gonna be kinetic energy and potential energy. So mass is oscillating. It's moving means it, it has a kinetic energy half mb squared. And the spring is being stretched or compressed. So that means it has elastic potential energy. So let's look at a simple uh, setup here. It's oscillating, let's say horizontal so that the height is not changing, okay? So, but these analysis, if we uh, do it from the mean position, even when it's going up and down, uh, they work just fine, okay? So in that case, so we may have to include if height is changing, we may have to use that change in height from the equilibrium position, okay? But let's do the simple one here. So kinetic energy and potential energy, and we know in this kind of oscillation, this thing is slowing down and B becomes zero here, and B is maximum here at equilibrium position, and B is zero here again, and this here, X is maximum here and here, means the potential energy is maximum. So where potential energy is maximum, kinetic energy is zero. P zero means kinetic energy is zero. So there is just back and forth of kinetic and potential energy between these, you know, between these two energies and total energy on the other hand remains constant, okay? So that's what we are doing here. So in this snapshot, you see they are taken at same time interval, same time interval. So it's like a motion diagram. It's a motion diagram. So it's moving faster here and then slowing down, okay? So it's slowing down here. It's closer and closer means slowing down, right? Same thing there. So now we can uh, talk about the energies. So when this thing is all the way here, that's when the potential energy is maximum and that it can be written as half Ka square, A being how far it moves from the equilibrium position. In another word, A is an amplitude, right? So that's the maximum value. So X is changing with time. So that means potential energy is changing. But maximum value for a given oscillation, if it's, uh, let's say, not coming closer and closer, it's not damping, then in that case, what happens? It remains constant. But if A change, then this one also gonna change. So for this oscillation, if there is no friction, uh, then in that case, what's gonna happen? A gonna remain fixed, not gonna change. So since B is zero, kinetic energy is zero. So that means total energy gonna be just equal to the maximum potential energy, okay? So total energy is just the potential energy because kinetic energy is zero. And that is this, which is maximum value of potential energy. So we know that. Now let's look at the equilibrium point. What happens at equilibrium point? V is maximum means kinetic energy is maximum, but X is zero here. That's what equilibrium position means. Uh, so potential energy is zero there. No stretch, no compress at equilibrium position. So once it crosses it, it starts compressing and or stretching depending on which side it is approaching from. So that means the maximum kinetic energy is this, and this is also equal to the total energy. So now from the principle of conservation of energy, we know the total energy remains same, means 
the maximum kinetic energy and maximum potential energy, they have to be same. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now with this, we can write an equation. Half and half gonna cancel. So we can write the equation for Vm, maximum speed. Okay. So last class we wrote Vm maximum value as a omega times a. We simply said it is omega times a. Now we are proving that, okay? So here omega is that under root case k over m is the omega, okay? So that's what the omega is means it's omega times a. So the velocity is changing but if you are asked what's the maximum velocity, then you can use omega times a. Sometimes you then use this for any velocity. Remember, velocity keeps on changing. So it cannot be any velocity. It is only the maximum velocity, okay? So now here is a question for you. And you have a minute to answer this question. Thirty more seconds. And five more seconds. Five, four, three, two one and it stops. Okay, let's see what we got. Ooh. MLR. So if I'm thinking A as the correct answer, am I right or wrong and why folks? I think you're right. And why is that? Uh, supposing that R is the maximum position, right? The maximum pull. Then the middle point between A and negative A is, is, is going to be where you have the maximum kinetic energy. It is at the point of A or negative A in which you will have zero kinetic energy, but plenty of potential energy. Right, that makes sense. So that's why I'm already giving credit for A here. So B, B is maximum at equilibrium point. So B maximum means kinetic energy is maximum, right? We just did that. We just did that in last slide, folks. And I know somebody was trying to tell something. Can, yeah, go ahead. B maximum means kinetic energy is maximum, right? Okay. So we can make plot of kinetic energy, potential energy, and total energy. Let's suppose that dot you see on the screen is a mass and it is attached to invisible spring. And, oh, what happened? I thought, yes, so that's uh, oscillating back and forth. So X is equal to zero is the equilibrium position, okay? Yes, of course, this uh, 
representation is not quite correct uh, because it doesn't seem like it's moving fastest here. I don't know, it's hard to tell, but yes, of course, that's what happens. So that's, it's, it starts slowing down and that's where velocity becomes zero, right? And similarly, once it crosses here, slows down and velocity becomes zero. So maximum is here. So that also means uh, kinetic energy is maximum at x is equal to zero. So kinetic energy is gonna be maximum here. And since it's not moving, so at those amplitude position, kinetic energy is gonna be zero. So kinetic energy zero here, zero here. So here means A, I thought I wrote those A. Oh, I'm post writing potential, huh? So in potential first. On the other hand, kinetic energy is opposite, sorry, potential energy is opposite. So X zero means potential energy is zero. X maximum, see X is A here. Maximum means potential energy is maximum, okay? So those are the position of the X, okay? And kinetic energy is exactly opposite of that. So it appears as inverted one, okay? But the total, that means sum of potential and kinetic at any point is always remains constant. So for example, if I'm looking at this point here, X is, uh, let's say here, the, that's the kinetic energy, okay? So kinetic energy is just that. So we are plotting total energy here, right? And these are the kinetic and potential energy line. Red line is kinetic energy line. So this much is the kinetic energy. And the remaining one is the potential energy. So this part is kinetic energy. Uh, not all the way up there. Let's see, how much is kinetic energy? So X is here. So maybe I should draw from here. So that's gonna be the potential energy. So that's potential energy and that's kinetic energy. So when we add this kinetic energy on top of potential energy, total becomes this much, okay? And so the total remains same no matter at what point you look at it. And if we are just looking at the maximum values, total is equal to also equal to maximum kinetic and also maximum potential, just like we talked in a slide before. Okay. So that's how the energy profile of the oscillatory motion looks like. So there is interchange between kinetic and potential. And shape, uh, if you are uh, familiar with a little bit graph and the equation, see this kx squared means parabola, and that's what you are seeing here, okay? And b also related to x. So if I were to write that down in terms of x, it's gonna also come out as a some sort of x squared form. So both of these are parabola. And uh, the fit has this, you know, it, it visualizes how kinetic and potential energy are changing when it's oscillating and going back and forth from the equilibrium position. Uh, I suggest you, you know, try that, play with that. But uh, this is what uh, it looks like if we are graphing those energies, okay? So now, here is question where we use energy concept to solve problem, okay? So energy concept, if we ignore the friction, then the total mechanical energy at one point versus at any other point, they are equal, right? Total mechanical energy remains same. So that means sum of kinetic and potential energy remains same. 
So in this case, what do we know? We know the string constant, we know the mass, and this mass is oscillating, and it says when block is 3.345 meter from its equilibrium position. So I'm sketching this as equilibrium position. And that position is P. So P here is that 0.345. So rather than writing a number, I'm just denoting that by a variable. It can be any number, okay? Uh, but we can solve problems same way. So that's why I'm writing like this. So value of P can be any. So in this particular problem, value of P is that. P is just a notation here, okay? Just a notation, not a momentum, nothing. Just a notation of that point, okay? From the equilibrium position. So now, similarly, we know the velocity at the same point is also given. So we are denoting that by B at that point P, okay? Velocity, they're changing, but at that point, it has a fixed value. What is that value? I'm denoting that as a BP, and the number is just 0.543, right? So that's what that is. So those things we know. Now the question is, what is the maximum displacement of the block from equilibrium? So at this point, it is moving with that speed. It's still moving, it hasn't stopped. So it's gonna go farther before it stops. So how far it goes before it stops? That's the amplitude. And that's, the, that's what this question is asking about, okay? What is the maximum displacement of the block from the equilibrium? So in part A, it's asking amplitude is what? Maximum displacement means amplitude, right? So that's what it is asking. So let's say the V becomes a zero there, that's when the displacement is maximum. So that means B at that point, A is zero. So now we know X value and B value at this point means we know kinetic and potential energy at this point means we know total energy at this point. So we can use that information and set that equal to the total energy at that point and we can solve for it. Okay, so, so there are a, a, B, C, three parts in this problem, but each of these parts can be solved by using the same technique, conservation of energy, okay? One at a time. So this thing is known, so I'm gonna use just this as a known values. So I'm gonna using this point as a reference point and that EP, the total energy at point P gonna be same. Maybe I should write other way around. So total energy at A gonna be equal to total energy at P. We know that. How do we know? Because total energy is conserved. And this E means total energy at point A. So total energy at A is kinetic energy at A and potential energy at A. So elastic potential energy at A. Remember we used conservation of energy all the time. We added all the energy. So here A is like saying final, total energy at final point and total energy at initial point, initial point being P here, okay? If you like, you can write I here, F here, and write I here, F here, okay? You can do that. So for P, it is kinetic energy at point P plus potential energy, which is elastic potential energy at point P, 
we don't need to worry about gravitational potential energy here because height is not changing. So we don't need to worry about it. So we are just using conservation of energy, just like we used several times in the past. Okay, what is kinetic energy at A? V zero means kinetic energy is zero here. So this thing is zero. And what is elastic potential energy here? Half K X square, but X is A at that point. So I can replace X by A. So we have only one energy, which is maximum potential energy. So when one energy, one kind of energy is maximum, all that has to be zero, okay? So now, kinetic and energy at point P. So here, kinetic means half M and velocity at that point squared. Velocity at that point is, we said that was VP, VP squared. And potential energy, half K and X at that point is squared. What is X at that point? We said that is P square. So we know this number, all these numbers now, except A. So we can solve for A. So half cancels. I'm not canceling everything, just half, okay? Maybe I should circle. Half is everywhere, so I can get rid of that. So now A square gonna be, let's bring this K on this side. So that means when it comes this side, it's gonna divide the whole thing. And we can make look it prettier if we divide term by term. Dividing whole thing on that side means dividing every term, okay? So I can also write this as MBP square over K plus P square. See this divided by K means K gonna cancel, right? Uh, so, oops. So, so that's, that's why I'm separating it. But if you like to stick it around, you can do that, okay? But this looks a bit prettier. So now, So, so, so that means, so that's gonna be the amplitude square. So what is amplitude then? Oh boy, do I have room here? A is under the square root, this whole thing. M over K BP square. plus P square and BP square or BP is here and P is here. We know the position and velocity at that point. So that means depending on, so knowing how fast it's moving when it's going that way and what the string constant is, we can tell how far it's gonna go before it stops, okay? That's what this is. Okay. Now you can use the same technique for part B as well. What is the maximum speed of the block? Hey, we can use our knowledge. Yes, of course we can use conservation of energy, but we have already used that to find maximum speed, right? Remember BM part B, BM is omega times A. And omega is also K over M under the square root times A. So K is known, M is known now, since we know A, we can just use that. But if you do not want to use that, you can go through this. Rather, what you need to do is, now use the total energy at point P is equal to total energy at point 
uh, what point is that? Let's say zero point or O point, okay? So here you can just write E at zero or O and write this equation just like this. So in this case, the kinetic energy is going to be zero. Sorry, sorry. Potential energy is going to be zero at this point, and the kinetic energy is going to be maximum. Okay. Unlike at this point, it was opposite. Here, the potential energy was maximum, and kinetic is zero. Now, for part C, it's a general. Part C is more general. When the block is at point two zero zero meter from the equilibrium position. So this is at point three four five. So that means there is another point. Let's say that's a Q. Q is point two zero zero. Now the question is, what is speed at that point? So now since we know a lot of things, we can use any two points with this point as one point, okay? <clears throat> and you can solve this problem. But if you wanna stick with the original given point, what you can do is you can use this point and that point. So let's do that one here, okay? So it's gonna look kinda exactly same, but at that point, both points, none of the quantities are zero. So that means we're gonna have all four terms rather than just three terms in our equation. So for part C, let's say Q, right? Q is 0 0.200 0 meter and BQ is what? So we want BQ. I'm kind of here trying to save some space. Excuse my writing. So E at point Q must be equal to E at point P total energy is same all over, everywhere, okay? So that's the knowledge we are using. So kinetic energy at point P, sorry, this is Q, right? Kinetic energy at Q plus potential energy. So since there is no gravitational, I'll just write U rather than UE. That's gonna make bit simpler. So UQ, KQ plus UQ must be equal to KP plus UP. So total energy at Q is equal to total energy at P. So I'm writing same thing again by breaking them down. Since nothing is zero, I could have directly written this half MBQ square, right? So that's the kinetic energy at point Q plus what is potential energy at point Q? It's elastic, so half K, X is square, but X is Q, Q is square. So I'm writing a number, my number is Q, and Q can be anything. And for this problem, we know that is point two. So KP means half M BP square plus half K and UP. We already wrote this. It is just KP square. X at point P is P. So I'm writing P instead of X because X keeps on changing. P is a fixed point over all possible x here, okay? So that's that. And what do we want? We want BQ, means BQ is here. So we need to move everything on the other side. So we need to do a little flossing here. So let's cancel half 
it's everywhere so that means now we can move kq square over here right so since i'm running out of room can i make a little room here right here in this line you guys want to write underneath this but what i'm going to do is i'm going to just flush that from here to oh, it was kq right it was positive when it comes here it's going to be negative hey and i can just get rid of half for this step step okay and if you like you can let's say pack the key out from these two there is none so now let's move m to this side so next step this by m this by m and this term is also divided by m so in this case this m cancels so since i already moved m m is not here so my next step looks like this so i can also get rid of this m here That's a BQ squared. So what is BQ then? Under the square root, everything. So BP square plus KP square minus KQ square, and there is M on the bottom. It's gonna look nicer if I factor K over M from these two terms. Okay. And you don't need to plug in k and m several times while solving for the answer okay so that's the speed at point q folks that's the speed so that's how we use energy concept in oscillatory motion this kinetic and potential energy just like we did for the energy you know energy concept we learn in when we talked about work and energy when we talked about rotational energy so there were like other kind of energy as well rotational energy when things were rotating here things are not rotating just moving back and forth means there is elastic potential energy okay looks like i don't have answer for uh, part c did anybody get the answer for C? So what do we expect? B at Q, is it larger than B at P or smaller? What do you expect? Without doing solving problem, what do you expect? Should be larger. Should be larger, that's right. So largest one is 1.1, if I did calculate this correctly, okay? And at this point, which is BP, it is half. So now at Q, the answer should be between these two number. Less than 1.1, but more than 0.54, okay? So are you getting that? And are you also seeing it should be that can you make that kind of logic okay that's the important part of doing physics <laughs> okay so it has to be smaller than the maximum value at 1.1 but larger than this because it's slowing down when it's going that way right so it's in the middle somewhere but it's not uniform it goes under the square root so because of that you cannot just uh, take the ratios and find the answer you need to do this kind of calculation okay and feel free to type your answer on the chat and verify with each other if you already did do the calculation
So now let's use the knowledge we learn to answer this question here. And you have a minute and 30 seconds to answer this question. Thirty more seconds. Five more seconds, five, four, Three, two, one, and it stops. Let's see what we got. So mostly A, which is correct answer. And since it is our uh, break time, I'm gonna <laughs> tell you guys that rather than asking you. So uh, maximum speed, and amplitude. Maximum speed and amplitude, they are related by this equation. B max is omega times A. Period is fixed means omega gonna be fixed because it's two pi over T, that's what the omega is, that's A. So velocity is directly proportional to the amplitude, everything else being same, okay? Uh, so, that means when A becomes two times A, B max becomes two times the B max, so doubles. So that's why A is correct answer. Okay, folks, let's take a break. And if you have question, feel free to ask or if you have some idea, feel free to share. Open, and I will send this out in an email, but they'll be kind of open just for you to come and ask any questions you need to if you have a question about a worksheet question, anything like this, I'm going to leave it open. If no one has questions, I'll, I'll talk about things, but um, I'll leave that open for anyone to just come those last three days and ask any question that you need. Um, so keep that in mind. Again, I'll send this all out in an email, uh, but that's how the last few days of uh, SI is going to go. So if you have any questions, just let me know. Thank you so much, Dr. Ngan. Okay, no problem. Okay, folks. Okay, welcome back. So we are talking about oscillatory motion. So when things are going in circle, and if we can project that to the, you know, the object, position of object, to one of the diameter of the circle, what happens is uh, that we can say, okay, it's a, it's acting like oscillatory motion. And here is an example, this video. In this display, we can see that the circular motion produced by the round object, the projection of that is a linear motion. Let's see if I can get it right. We're getting pretty close. The pendulum motion the shadow of the rotating object are almost lined up now. 
So the circular motion itself is not the simple harmonic motion, but it's projection. The object that's moving in circle is projection to one of its diameter is circular motion, okay? And so uh, that's, uh, and then with that, we can use all the formula we have written so far uh, to describe uh, that kind of motion as well. So all we need to do is we need to just look at the position of the projection of that point. So for example, how do you make the projection? If I have a circle like this, and if something is moving in a circle, and if I want to project, so this center of the circle is like a equilibrium position for the uh, projection point. So this point is the projection point, projected point for this object when it is there, about this diameter here, okay? So how far it is from equilibrium position? This far. And when it arrives here, that's the maximum, that's like a amplitude, okay? And when it goes there, you project to that diameter, now this is gonna be the position. So, so it looks like it, it's going this way and then coming down that way and goes that way and comes back. So and so on. So that's how it's oscillating back and forth. The shadow or the projection is oscillating back and forth like a pendulum, okay? So in real life, what happens is all oscillation kind of dies down, right? Uh, so for example, if you set a pendulum for oscillation, after oscillating, uh, I don't know, many times, it's gonna stop. So that means its amplitude is decreasing. So when that's the case, so all real oscillation, they are damped, okay? So damped oscillation looks like this. So the amplitude is here, goes there, and when it comes back, it doesn't make all the way there. It returns a little bit uh, from the closure. So for example, if this pendulum is oscillating, and then what happens? In fostering, if it reaches here, oh, let's go this way. In fostering, if it goes there, all the way there, the next swing, when it comes back, it may not reach all the way there. It's gonna repeat a little bit, you know, closer from there. So uh, that's what you see here. So it starts from here for the fast oscillation. Next time it's uh, almost there and so on, right? So this is called damped oscillation. So now, what if you need to keep this oscillation going? Then in that case, you need to apply force. So for example, a kid on a swing, what happens? If you give a push and let it go, swing gonna eventually stop. And kid gonna start crying. And you know that if you have had your kid or if you have kid, right? I know that. So for that swing to keep, you know, oscillating back and forth, to keep that oscillating back and forth, we need to just keep applying force. So when that happens, we say that's the forced oscillation, okay? So damped oscillation is real oscillation. And to keep oscillation going, we need to apply some sort of force. So that's the thing we're gonna be talking here. 
So damp oscillation, for example, if you are putting your kid in a swing and hoping it's gonna just keep oscillating forever, not gonna happen, that's bad, right? But sometimes we can make use of damped oscillation for good. So for example, we drive car and uh, under the hood, near the uh, wheel, there are these shock absorbers. I'm pretty sure you have noticed that, right? If you have ever looked under the hood, <laughs> But if you haven't, it's there, okay? So now what happens is there is spring and there is this mass, whole mass of the car is attached to that spring. And because of that, what happens? If car hits some sort of, uh, let's say, put, you know, pothole, some ditch, what happens? It, it starts oscillating but we don't want that oscillation keep going. We want to stop it. That's where uh, this spring with the large value of K comes in handy. And sometimes to help that we may also need, we may also put some viscous fluid so that it provides further damping, okay? And so what we want is, let's suppose it, got extended all the way there. We want this to just stop oscillating. So bump up and then when it comes to original position, it shouldn't be oscillating anymore. We don't want it to go down from the equilibrium and come back up and down like this. Nope, we don't want that, right? So this kind of oscillation is called critical oscillation critically damped oscillation. And that's what we are looking for when we are using this kind of system. That's what we are trying to achieve, okay? So to get that, what value of K damping is needed? And based on that, we design that, okay? So that's the damped oscillation. So now let's talk about forced oscillation. And forced oscillation can cause uh, resonance. Resonance is when something oscillates with maximum amplitude. That happens when frequency of oscillation matches with the frequency of the force that keep pushing that to keep oscillating. So for example, if we are talking about the kids on the swing, remember? we match our push with that oscillation. If we mismatch, the oscillation gonna go wild, okay? So, if we are matching that, then the oscillation keeps going and with the minimal force, okay? We don't need to make large effort if we can match it, okay? So that's called a resonance. So, for example, the pendulum has a frequency, natural frequency. And if we know the length of the pendulum, that's the T. So that means F is one over T period, right? So it has a fre frequency, that's the natural frequency. So everything, so equation may not be that straightforward, but everything has its own natural frequency. So if it gets pushed by the same frequency, well, then what happens? It goes to that oscillation, I mean that resonance. So at resonance, it is oscillating with maximum amplitude. So maximum amplitude in the swing, it's gonna be fun. But if a breeze like this it gets, you know, into that kind of oscillation, then the accident may happen. And here is an example of that caught in video. And of course, this was
is very similar to the on the swing. Well, sort of. Hopefully the kid won't shatter. With the wine glass, sound plays the role of the pusher, while the glass plays the role of the swing. You see, sound is just a pressure wave traveling through a medium, in this case the air. When the waves hit the glass, it pushes the glass back and forth by a tiny amount. Just like the swing, if you push the glass too frequently or too slowly, it won't build up a large amplitude. In order for the amplitude to grow, the frequency of the sound has to match the natural frequency of the glass. If you're curious what that frequency is, ping the side of the glass. The sound you hear is a natural frequency. This happens to be around 500 hertz for many glasses, meaning you want the sound generated by the speakers to be around 500 hertz. If the volume of the speaker is high enough and the sound waves hit the glass just right, the glass can be shattered by sound alone. The important thing to realize here is that it's not just the volume of the sound that breaks the glass. Okay, volume provides the amplitude, uh, but frequency, when frequency matches, that frequency also, you know, like uh, makes it oscillate at maximum amplitude. So that's the resonance. So this is also an example of resonance. So there can be sometimes, you know, there's disaster because of the resonance, but there are a lot of use of the resonance. For example, your cell phone, when it's, you know, like, let's say, you know, like, let's say when you are calling somebody or receiving call, uh, that means it has a circuit inside, it is receiving or working in a particular frequency. So if you look at the specific of specification of a cell phone, it's gonna note down the range of the cell, you know, the frequency that gonna work. So now what happens is, if you have a particular, you know, the uh, career of that, uh, uh, let's say, uh, T-Mobile, Verizon, something like that, what happens is they are working in a particular uh, frequency range. Another obvious example we always do is like tuning up, tuning in, you know, you're, you're tuning up your uh, radio or television. So what's happening is these stations, they are broadcasting their signal in a particular frequency. And then when the frequency of your device matches. So by changing channel, by uh, plugging in numbers, by turning the knob, you are matching the frequency. When that happens, what happens? Maximum current flows through the circuit and that's when you see the clear voice. So there are a lot of places uh, this resonance is being used, okay? Our ear also, you know, like uh, listens by taking those waves. So if there is eardrum and there is vibration in eardrum, uh, so that gets transmitted through the, there is a pipe and fluid inside. What happens? <laughs> Depending on where it is, and then it has different resonance point because we can hear large range of frequency. So it's oscillating there as well, vibrating, resonating with the frequency of the sound that comes from, okay? So forced oscillation or driven oscillation can cause a resonance. When does the resonance occur? When frequency of the driving source matches with the frequency, natural frequency of the oscillating object, okay? So here is such plot. So there is frequency here in this side and there is amplitude. So what you see is when frequency 
driving frequency matches with the frequency of the oscillating object and it's exactly exact match that's when the maximum amplitude is and how high this max amplitude gonna be so it depends on that particular oscillating system but it's gonna be maximum for that particular system at that frequency okay lower the frequency uh, the amplitude decreases increase the frequency then that amplitude decreases so you are getting this nice peak so when you see that kind of nice peak in this frequency versus amplitude plot that means that's where the resonance is happening and the frequency at which that happens is the resonant frequency okay so i was talking about this here so what happens here so sound here causes the vibration on the bone here and that transmit that over here so it's it's coiled so we can make it straight a little bit right so what happens it's pounding here and setting this thing in vibration and now what happens that creates the resonance in a certain portion of that a tube and uh, uh, that that what we can hear okay so there is a resonance when we are a listening sound voice. So what's the result of oscillation? The result of oscillation is wave. So for example, if you tap on the water surface, it produces wave. So for example, if, when the ball there, you know, it splashes on the water, it's producing this wave here, okay? So this wave is moving. Similarly, if you tie a string on one side and then shake this one up and down, what happens? You can create this pulse, a wave and it can move, right? So that speed at which it moves, that's the speed of the wave, right? So that's a, so now you may have produced wave. So what happens is when wave is moving along this medium, particle of the medium are just oscillating they are not moving from one point to all the way other point they are not doing that okay so for example when you are producing wave in the stadium like this you are not moving from one place to another place right time you are just giving that wave so you are just oscillating in place the so same thing happens when there is wave propagating through the medium so for example when wave is propagating through the water, these water molecules, they are just oscillating up and down here, okay? Here, same thing is happening when pulse is traveling here, these points, they are oscillating up and down. So they are just helping it to pass or move without moving themselves. So for example, sometimes we line up to pass, let's say, brick, right? To pass the bricks. So in that case, we may, form, we may form a line and then, you know, we may just move our hand and what happens? We are not moving, but the brick is moving. So same thing is happening when there is wave passing through a certain medium, okay? So it may look like water is moving but water is not moving from one point to another point when wave is traveling like that okay it's just oscillating oscillating about the mean position so there are two kinds of oscillation depending on which way the wave is traveling 
versus which way the oscillation of the particle is taking place, okay? So here, if you were to hold on a slinky and then move this sideways, what's gonna happen? Wave gonna move this way. So the direction of propagation of a wave and the direction of propagation of particle, they are 90 degree here. So when that's kind of situation, we call that transverse wave. But when both of them are in same direction, so we may produce slinky motion like this. So if we just oscillate, you know, along the length of the slinky. So in that case, what happens? The slinky, uh, the wire, individual wires, they are also oscillating in the same direction the wave is propagating. But of course, the slinky, these are just staying in place, okay? Just this compression and rear fraction, they are moving, okay? So when that's the situation, that kind of situation, that's called longitudinal waves. So when we speak, what happens? Our sound travels from us to listener. So in that case, there is air. So these air particles are vibrating back and forth. We cannot see it because they are very small for our eyes but they are vibrating back and forth. And one vibrating is giving energy to the other one and that is starts vibrating and that's how it passes, okay? So this is an example. Sound is an example of longitudinal wave, okay? Wave on a string on the other hand, that's an example of transverse wave. Light, uh, that basically is covered in second semester. That is an example of transverse wave where, oh, no particles, but field, magnetic and electric field are oscillating there perpendicular to the direction of propagation, okay? So a lot of waves and all these waves are produced by oscillation. So for example, in the slinky, we are oscillating our hand and we are producing that oscillation on the slinky. When light is coming out from a light bulb, there is electron oscillating back and forth and that's producing the light wave, okay? So this oscillation, result of oscillation is wave. Once wave gets generated, what happens? It propagates, it moves, and it doesn't care about the source anymore. So how do we describe that kind of motion? So some motion are a bit simpler. For example, they repeats over time. So since the source of wave is oscillation, by keeping track of oscillation, we can tell a lot of things about how the wave gonna be moving. We can do that, okay? And uh, so here, let's take a look here. It repeats on its own, so that's why it is called periodic wave, okay? And we have seen this kind of wave, for example, you know, for example, if we do EKG, uh, we may see something like this kind of repetition here, you see there is peak. Peak there, so peak to peak distance that we call one wavelength, okay? And there is repetition of pattern, not just that, you see that, it's there, it's there. So as long as it is regular, that's great, okay? As long as it is periodic, but if the period is starts disturbing, that means it's not functioning well. You need serious health checkup <laughs> and maybe treatment, okay? And so that's how the knowledge of this oscillation can help to diagnose uh, uh, this, uh, your condition.
So, how is it moving? So we can use, for example, uh, keep track of, let's say, if a peak is, you know, moving a distance delta x, and it has a speed v, then we can relate those displacement speed and time just using the, I guess, very fast equation we learned in this class, right? <laughs> we can use that. So now, if it moves through a distance from peak to peak, that distance is one wavelength, and this time is one period, okay? So that means wavelength is speed times period. So that's the famous equation for any wave, okay? Speed, wavelength, and time period are related like that. So even more famous in terms of frequency. So T and frequency is one over T, right? So frequency is one over T. So if I were to bring this T on this side, it becomes lambda over t, so it becomes lambda times f. So it becomes lambda times f. One over t is frequency. So this is the equation in, you find in the formula sheet, okay? So, so what is it helping us to find out? If we know, let's say, frequency, like, uh, you know, we can find the frequency of oscillation of source that producing wave. We can observe that source and find frequency. And we can also measure the wavelength. And if we know wavelength and frequency, we can find speed. Or if we know any two of these, then we can find third one, okay? So uh, that comes out handy while describing wave motion. So we can write equation. So since it is going, you know, as you can see, it looks like either sine or cosine. So if we look at the top of these oscillating particle here, it looks like the wave is moving, right, sideways. But if we just look at one particle, just like you see here, the blue, what it is doing is it is just going back and forth, back and forth. It's just oscillating in place, okay? So we can write the equation for this kind of oscillation. So this is basically, let's say if we were to take a snapshot of this, let's suppose it's not moving. That means it can be sine or cosine, right? If we take a snapshot, for example, if it happens to be maximum at that point, then it's gonna be cosine. If it happens to be minimum, then that's gonna be sine. So we can write this oscillating thingy in terms of sine and cosine, and that's what we learned when we were talking about simple harmonic motion, right? So oscillation, simple harmonic motion, we can write in terms of sine or cosine. Okay, so now, this oscillating thing is producing this moving wave. So now we need to relate that oscillation with the moving thing. So when we combine that, what we're gonna do, get is wave equation. So this is cosine, and now what happens here, the x we wanna write in terms of wavelength. Because for a wave, wavelength is a standard. So if we can write it like that, then it's gonna be easier. So what is wavelength? One wavelength is when it repeats itself, means when it goes through one complete cycle. So it's like equivalent to two pi radian or 360 degree, okay? So we can make use of that and replace or convert x in terms of wavelength, okay? Two pi is equivalent to one wavelength. Remember this x here, this is angle. And uh, 
here we want to insert wavelength and that's what we are doing so in this case there is no time just position it's simply telling us where the position of the particle gonna be at different x values as it moves sideways as it moves sideways so that's the x what's its value in y direction that's what it is telling right so now what we want to do is we want to introduce time so we can do that by writing angle in terms of omega times t we know that and omega is 2 pi over t period so let's write that down okay so that gives us the position with respect to time so position with respect to x what position vertical position with respect to horizontal position and vertical position with respect to time now we want to combine this so there are two possibilities one is just adding them okay another one is subtracting so here you see i'm subtracting one from another one so that gives me this equation that has both time and position and i can do the same thing by adding it so here this term here 2 pi over lambda i replace that by k notation and it has a name as well we call wave number okay and so how many times the wave is uh, repeating so that gives you uh, wave number k so that looks neat and nice but more useful form is this when we want to extract things out of the equation okay so when we add what happens we get this so by adding and subtracting what we are doing is we are producing a equation or we are writing equation that describes wave moving either in positive x direction or negative x direction okay so it could be a little bit confusing here it's a kind of opposite so when you have a term with a negative sign of you know negative in front of x that gives you a wave that's moving to the positive x direction negative sign here means it gives you things that's moving in positive x direction so and this positive means opposite of that moving the negative okay and we can verify that by plotting this equation by taking several steps on on time okay and that's what i'm doing here so what i'm doing is i'm plotting those equation at different times so at one at half second so when i do that i get a snapshot at that time okay to make plot when i need to find different values of x or i should say different values of y at different position so we can do that and uh, once we have that number we can plot that and make graph right but these days we have softwares that can you know nicely produce uh, this kind of graph so you can just plug in this equation and you can see it right uh, desmos and uh, uh, there is another one that i use i i forget at this moment for some reason so we can see this so by doing this what am i looking at at one time the peak is here for example and then now when i make the same plot for t is equal to one second what happens see peak moved here it was near here it moved here so it's moving towards the positive x direction so that had that's what it means so equation with the negative sign gives you the wave moving in positive x direction it's kind of opposite okay hey do you remember that let's try
a minute. Thirty more seconds. Five more seconds. Five, four, three, two. One and it stops. Okay. So here we need to decide whether sine and sine or cosine first. So is it sine or cosine? So at zero it is maximum. So cosine zero is positive one maximum. Sine zero is zero. So if it had started from there, it would be sine this is cosine so that means one with the sine they are not correct so now we need to decide whether it has a positive or negative sign and for that if it is moving to positive x direction remember the x picks up opposite sign means that's that so let's see you got that so mostly yes but there were a lot of confusion as well <laughs> so let's see confusion was with the positive or negative so let's not forget that now okay and uh, yeah i would love to do this problem here oh what is the problem yeah but we ran out of time so i'll just leave it here folks uh, so, for example, if you are given speed, you can here, from here, you can, from this plot, you can find period. See, this is time. So that means it's a period. So period is how many seconds? Hey, four seconds looks like. And that means frequency is one over four means 0 0.25 hertz so by knowing period we know the frequency and there is speed that means we can calculate wavelength v is f times lambda means lambda is v over f that means we know wavelength as well. So now once we know T and wavelength, we can we know omega. Omega is two pi over T. And how about K? K is two pi over wavelength, right? So once we have omega K, and we know it's moving to this direction and this is starts from here we can tell it is cosine just like we saw in the last question and this is omega t minus kx and this is the amplitude what is amplitude that is the amplitude which is positive eight in this case and the unit is centimeter so eight centimeter cosine and omega, yeah, you need to calculate number using this. T minus K, calculate number, X. Hey, that's the wave equation for this wave, okay? <laughs> so that's how we write it. And if you know wave equation, you can find frequency, wavelength, speed of the wave. So you can construct wave, you can deconstruct wave to find the properties. So that's how it works, folks. So that's where I'm going to be leaving, okay? And uh, 
feel free to stick around if you have a question or if you like to share idea i'm going to be around have a great day sir it's here okay otherwise i'll see you guys on wednesday for the review thank you and thank remember, you remember fcqs they are due by tomorrow night i'll be also sending reminder Thank you. Thank you. I'll see you later, Doctor. I'm gonna have a good day. Hey, see you, Carl, on Wednesday. Yep, I'll see you then. Bye.